Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Happy Easter. We welcome you to First United Methodist Church this morning to celebrate the history-altering fact that Christ was resurrected. And it's just as Christ was resurrected, we also have that certain hope of resurrection.
let us affirm our Apostles' Creed. This is also found printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and set it at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you would join me for the invitation to Holy Communion to be followed by the confession and pardon, it's printed in your bulletin. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Good morning, and He is risen. Thanks be to God. I'm Dale Cohen, senior pastor, and it's my privilege to welcome you uh, along with our associate, Reverend Dr. Terry Stubblefield. We're so glad that you chose to be with us to celebrate Easter today. It's a very special service and a wonderful time where we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to welcome those who are watching online. We're glad that you've joined us as well. I encourage you to follow along. All the liturgy of the service will be on the screen so you can participate as if you were here. We would also love to know that you're with us today and so if you could go to our website, fumcflow.org and click on the registration link or if you just wanna put that you're present in the comment section on Facebook, that's good too. We're just so glad you're with us. And everybody here, I want to encourage you to fill out a connection card. It's the tear-off section of the worship guide. And in just a few moments, when the offering is collected, as the play goes by, you can drop your completed card in there. If you're visiting with us, please let us know that you're here. I promise you we're not going to show up on your doorstep or harass you in any way. Uh, but we would just love to know that you're with us today where we can send you uh, a greeting and let you know how thankful we are for your presence. As a church, our vision is to offer creative experiences that lead people to inspiring encounters with God, meaningful engagement with each other, and lifelong transformation. We celebrate today the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but at the same time, we recognize that the grace that saves is also the grace that sanctifies. Our lives are in a continual state of change. 
And we hope and pray that the changes that we go through will be changes that bring us closer to God. And God makes His Holy Spirit available to us. So yes, indeed, we believe in lifelong transformation. That we'll continue to grow in that ever-deepening relationship with Jesus Christ that is available to each of us. I want to share with you a, a couple of activities that are happening in the life of our church. Uh, Reverend Dr. Terry Stubblefield will resume his study on the book of Ephesians on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. Uh, you can join us for dinner beginning at 5. And if you'd like to make a reservation for that, you can check that on your connection card or call the church office by noon tomorrow. This Thursday, April 21st, the Birmingham Southern College uh, Concert Choir will be in concert here in our sanctuary. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Lester Siegel, is the director of that, and I'm really looking forward to the program that they're going to share with us Thursday at 7 p.m. Looking out ahead a little bit, some of you have seen our production of Smoke on the Mountain before. Well, we're reprising that and doing it again with a few different folks. Uh, that will be Thursday, uh, April 28th, Friday the 29th, and Saturday the 30th. Those of you who have seen this production, you know it's a, 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 a must-see, and so uh, be sure to get your tickets so that you don't miss out on that. Also, on Thursday, the 28th of April, that will be our next installment of what we call Crafted Conversations. I don't know if you've heard of a concept called third space, but third spaces are places where people go to connect and dialogue. Uh, there's, it's a no-pressure atmosphere. The way we do it, we invite a local musician to come. This time it'll be Mark Narmore. And then we have a topic that we use for discussion. And it's a great time. We do it at Singing River Brewery and um, would love for you to join us at 7 o'clock on the 28th. Today, we're celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion. And in our church, anyone who desires to receive the sacrament is welcome to do so. You don't have to be a member of this church or any church because the invitation that Calvin read just a few moments ago is an invitation that comes from God himself. God wants you to, to come and to receive this symbol of his love and his grace for you. At the end of the service, when we sing the Hallelujah Chorus, any of those uh, folks who would like to join the choir in singing, you can feel free to scoot out of your pew and come up here in that window over there or some scores that you can use uh, to follow along, and we'd love for you to do that. Now, it's Easter, and for a lot of people, when we think about Easter, we think about the Easter bunny and those hollow chocolate rabbits and jelly beans and malted milk balls and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's a big tradition at our house as well. But we also recognize that Easter represents the greatest gift ever given, and that is the gift of Jesus Christ who saves us from our sin and grants us eternal life in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we remember that gift as we offer our own gifts today. And to consecrate our offering, I want to invite Calvin to come forward and to offer the blessing. Calvin? Let us pray. Mighty God of resurrection and redemption, today we offer our gifts alongside of our alleluias. We offer the fruits of our labor, and we offer our hands and our feet and our voices to take the Easter celebration out of this sanctuary and into this world, a world that so desperately seeks hope. May our gifts and our heart, soul, mind, and body go out today with such energy, excitement, and power that the very ground shakes once again, that lightning flashes, and that people see in you and us redeeming love and the triumph of light over the darkness. And this morning we pray in the name of the risen Christ. Amen.
Hear now a reading from John's Gospel, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there. But he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary, she stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Out of your word and into our hearts, may your truth take root and grow until we're overwhelmed by your love and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we conclude our series on the faces of Jesus. This was a series that we started at the beginning of Lent where we asked artists to give us their representation, their best depiction of the face of Jesus. And those paintings served as inspiration for the sermons that Terry and I have delivered throughout Lent and then again today. Today's inspiration comes from my wife Anne, her painting Illumination. And she wrote this about this painting. In reflecting on this painting, we see the dark green of the garden where Mary went early on that morning. Faint shades of blue and purple peek through as the morning light at dawn in the top left corner. 
Light illuminates the center of the canvas with subtle shadows of red, yellow, and orange emerging up in the right corner. Daybreak has come. I think Anne's depiction is a beautiful representation of the power and the mystery of the resurrection, which is an essential belief of the Christian faith. And that's why sometimes people ask me, is Jesus' resurrection real? Well, my answer is always yes. And it's yes because I've seen on too many instances evidence of the power of the resurrection in people's lives. I witness the reality of the resurrection every time someone accepts God's grace, resulting in them casting off their old self and taking on a new self, becoming a new creation. And this is what Paul talked about in Corinthians when he said, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Richard Gribble tells a story about Reverend David Johnson. He was fresh out of seminary, and he was putting the last touches on his sermon for his Easter, his first Easter at a new church, new pastor, new church, trying to make a good impression. So his wife asked what he was preaching on for Easter, and having only recently been plucked out of academia, he puffed up his chest, and he said, well, I'm going to be describing the resurrection as a metaphor for how we are no longer estranged from our authentic self. Well, he was so proud of what he had just said that he didn't notice his wife rolling her eyes. On Saturday evening before Easter, David went to the church to rehearse with the youth group for the sunrise service. At the end of the rehearsal, a couple of youth asked David for a ride home, which he said he was glad to do, but that they needed to remember he was still new in town, and so not only would he need directions how to get to their house, but then he would need directions how to get from their house back home to his house. After dropping the youth off and driving away, David was trying to remember which turn it was they said that he should take that would get him home. There were no cell phones back then, so he continued driving in hopes of finding someone that he could ask for help. Eventually, he found himself on a deserted dirt road, and so as he attempted to make a U-turn, the engine sputtered and stalled and completely died. He was not only hopelessly lost, but now he was out of gas, too. David felt sick. It was late. There was no sign of a house nearby, and after 20 minutes of walking, he finally saw some lights off in the distance, but it was a flashing neon sign. And as he got close enough, he could read, it was a place called the Boondocks. <laughs> Although new to town, David already knew from his parishioners that this was not a safe place to be late at night. As he approached the roadhouse, he walked through the parking lot and a slew of motorcycles, which added to his anxiety. As David walked inside, the smell of beer and cigarette smoke overwhelmed him. And he didn't see anybody he recognized, and that was both a comfort and a disappointment at the same time. <laughs> he wondered what his church members would say if they knew that their new pastor was at the boondocks on Saturday night before Easter. David approached the bartender, intending to ask to use a phone to call a cab, but his throat was a little parched from walking on the dirt road, and so he decided he would order a Coke first. Another patron, who was seated near him, invited him to play a game of pool. Well, David loved billiards. As a matter of fact, from the age of six, he'd been playing, so he was pretty good. Well, on this night, he wasn't just pretty good. He was on fire. He cleared the table on two consecutive games after the break. Well, this got the attention of this burly-looking guy. 
Everybody called him Turk. And he said, all right, I want to play you. Well, like I said, David was good. Turk was also good. But on that night, David was still better. And after winning three games, Turk invited him over to the bar and bought him another Coke and announced that from now on, David would be known as Shark. (laughs) Then Turk asked the inevitable question, what do you do? After clearing his throat, David said, I'm the new minister at the church on Maple Street in town. And everybody in the bar heard that, and they were just kind of murmuring about this. And Turk said, quiet, we got a preacher in the house. And then Turk said to David, I've never been to church. My mother wasn't married when I was born, so the church people kicked her out. All I know about God, I learned from television. So tell me, why is Easter such a big deal? David began to tell this ragtag congregation about Jesus and how he loved everybody, including those who were considered unworthy of that love. He told them how Jesus cured people of diseases, forgave their sins, and demonstrated unconditional love in every way. And although Jesus healed people and taught them about God's love, there were some people who still despised him. One day, David said, Jesus was brought before a court where he was found guilty of being a revolutionary. He was sentenced to death, and they began immediately to bring about his execution. Roman soldiers nailed him to a cross. Because he had already been beaten and severely tortured before his crucifixion, he only lasted for about three hours on the cross. Some friends took his body down and laid it in a tomb just as dusk fell at the end of the day, right before the day of rest, the Sabbath. And they would need to return after the Sabbath to finalize Jesus' burial. You could have heard a pin drop in that bar as David told this story. He continued, On Sunday... One of Jesus' friends, a woman, Mary Magdalene, went to the tomb early in the morning to attend to his body, but it wasn't there. She ran to tell the other disciples who came to see for themselves. They left, but Mary stayed. Mary weeped as she looked into the tomb. But then she was shocked to see two angels there. It wasn't empty anymore. There were two angels who were seated, and they told her that Jesus wasn't there, that he had risen from the dead. Then, sensing someone behind her, Mary turned to see a man that she presumed to be the gardener, and so she asked him to tell her where he had taken Jesus' body, because then she would go there and take care of it. Then the man that she thought was a gardener called her name, Mary. And she realized that it was Jesus. Turk said, that's crazy. What's all this mean? David said, it means everything has changed. God's turning our world upside down. He's making losers into winners And he's making outsiders into insiders. And even more, he's turning death into new life. When God raised Jesus from the dead, he said he destroyed the power of sin. So it no longer has a hold on us because he can forgive anything. But death has also lost its power because he can raise the dead to life. That's why Easter is such a big deal. It changes everything. Well, the conversation began to die down and people resumed drinking and playing pool. And that gave David an opportunity to talk to Turk about his predicament with his car. Well, his new friend siphoned some gas out of his motorcycle and put David on the back of the motorcycle and rode back out to where his car was and got the gas in and then gave him directions as to how he could get back home. 
When David arrived home, his wife, who was worried and upset, finally calmed down as he told her about the adventure that he had. When she encouraged him to get to bed because he had an early morning ahead, he said, no, I've got a little bit of work to do on my sermon. The next day, David didn't talk about metaphors of the resurrection or self-authentication as he planned. Instead, he told the story of God raising Jesus from the dead and how that gives every one of us the opportunity for a new life. Many visitors were present at David's church that Easter, including a strange group of leather-clad bikers who parked their noisy motorcycles out in front of the church. After the service, one of the parishioners came up to greet them and asked, how did, how did y'all find our church? And Turk said, where was Shark? <laughs> David and Turk's encounter is a story of transformation through resurrection. As I said, I believe in the resurrection because I've seen its effects too many times for it not to be true. The miracle of the resurrection happens all the time in the rooms of the 18 weekly meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous that we host across the street back here where hurting and broken people tap into their higher power overcoming the harmful effects of addiction. That's resurrection. Resurrection happens in the lives of children here in our church when they hear of the love of God for them. And the only response they can give is that they want to give their whole hearts to Jesus Christ. Resurrection happens in our youth group as students experience God's love, moving them to explore a life of humble service where they will bring mercy and justice to the forgotten and the lonely. That's resurrection. And resurrection can happen to us too. That is, if we're willing to admit that we need Jesus to save us from our selfish and destructive desires. Is Jesus' resurrection real? Oh yes. And all you have to do is ask those of us who have received God's love and become a new creation. We would love to tell you about it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. At this time, I invite you to turn in your worship guide to the liturgy for the great thanksgiving. Terry's going to join me at the altar here, and we invite you to follow along. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy 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 Lord, God of power and might, heaven heaven and and earth are full of your glory. glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope, through the resurrection of your Son from the dead, 
and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and in thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let's pray together. Our, Our Father, Father, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy, be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread. bread. And, and forgive, forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Amen. This time I invite those who are going to assist to come forward. And as they're coming forward, let me share with you, uh, you will be directed to come down the center aisle to receive the sacrament. Terry and I will be located there at the altar rail with some helpers. And we'll tear off a piece of bread and place it in your hand. And then you take the bread and dip it lightly in the cup and then consume that. If for any reason you're uncomfortable doing that, we have these individual communion sets uh, that they're a little two-tiered thing. The top tier exposes the wafer and then the next one exposes the juice. We don't want any barriers to the sacrament. This is a symbol of God's love for you. And as we rehearse the story of our salvation, it reinforces for us God's presence through his promise that he would always be with us. We invite any and all to come.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and then for the choral benediction. And if you want to join them, please come forward. Christ is risen. Jesus has risen. And may we raise our heads, our hearts, our attitudes to serve Jesus.